You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm speaking this morning from the topic, Naked and Afraid. Hear the scripture that inspires this homily. I'm in 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of God who has called you out of darkness and into the marvelous light. Let us pray. We are a peculiar people, Lord, that you love us is the miracle. Because most of the time we're out of our minds, possessed by our possessions, seeking more, sharing less, unwilling to follow, afraid to lead. At the start of this new school year, we stand naked before you, covered by your abiding love, ready for whatever comes. Amen. There's a relatively new reality television show on the Discovery Channel. It's called Naked and Afraid. Have some of you seen it? The premise is that two people, usually a man and a woman, are dropped off in a primeval wilderness, Indonesia, Panama, the swamps of Louisiana, anywhere that the producers can be certain that there will be extreme hardship leeches, and dangerous predators in the shadows. The participants must take off all of their clothes, meet each other for the first time, and then find food, water, build shelter. Their task is to survive for 21 days, as the announcer puts it, naked and afraid. Of course, a small crew follows them around, ready to offer emergency help in case that alligator really is going to eat them. But otherwise, the crew is not to intervene. And of course, the television nods to our aversion about nakedness. So they use various size blurs to cover those parts of the body that are usually considered private. Who are the people who volunteer to go on this show? This is not the old survivor, you know, drama at tribal council. Many of these participants have had to be airlifted out with dysentery and malaria and all kinds of extreme weight loss. To add insult to injury, if you make it 21 days, you have to travel to an extraction point up a mountaintop or across a body of water filled with gators and piranha. Who would do this? There's no compensation. All you get is an uptick in your wilderness competency rating. Talk about some peculiar people. These are peculiar people to say the least. But my point this morning is so are we. We are all so peculiar people and that's a good thing. We enter this world naked, crying and afraid, without road maps, no guides, and there aren't blurs big enough to hide the nitty-gritty nastiness of who we can be, our habits, our eccentricities. This TV show reminds me that even when we're wearing our designer best, we are naked and afraid. Now, this is one of those television shows that you really want to turn off. (laughs) But you can't look away. So I thought, as I couldn't look away, I got to do this sermon, so why don't I try to find some biblical something in this madness? So I go to the Older Testament, Dr. Pressler, and it turns out that Naked and Afraid is not an invention of reality TV. It appears first in Genesis. In the end, in the Garden of Eden, after the tempting and the blaming and the lying and the hiding, Adam and Eve face God naked and afraid. And what does God do? God doesn't say, what is it, laundry day? Where are your clothes? God says, who told you you were naked? It really does matter who tells you that you're naked and vulnerable. If God were to ask me today, B, 
who told you you're naked? I'd have to say the 24-hour news cycle that tells me I should be afraid of neighbors, that we are vulnerable to future attacks, that we should be afraid of Muslims and young black men. So who tells you that you're naked and afraid? And that on the anniversary of 9-11, that in a conflicted world, that the only thing that resolves it is more conflict. Hold that thought. Let's go to the New Testament, see if we can find some folks who are naked and afraid. There it is. Luke 8, 26 to 38, tells a story of a man who seems to be out of his mind, naked, chained, without a name, and his neighbors are afraid. I'm going to call him Willie because he deserves more than a description, okay? Now, this is a very peculiar story, and Jesus, who by the standards of our society and his is a little peculiar himself, goes into a cemetery where no rabbi would go. Gerasim, land of the Gentiles, a place known for raising pigs of all things, a commodity forbidden to good Jews. So why is Jesus here? He's here because his ministry is particular and peculiar. His ministry is not in the temple, not in safe sanctuaries, but in peculiar places doing peculiar things with even more peculiar people. And if we are going to serve God and humankind, we will do likewise. I mean, we really say we want to follow Jesus, but what we really want to do is chain Jesus up in the church. Because, I mean, after all, nobody's perfect, and you can't take Jesus everywhere and have him see in everything you do, because most of the time, we're out of our minds. But we forget that Jesus is not just some missionary saving souls. Jesus is the son of the living God who will confront systems of injustice for the sake of God's people. So that's what Jesus is doing in pig country. Willie and Jesus are eyeball to eyeball. Willie is naked and afraid. And the truth of the matter is Willie would rather be left alone. Because if Jesus frees him, what then is he going to do? He's going to have to get a job, insurance, a haircut. He's going to have to apply for disability. He will have to find his joy, his calling, his purpose. And sometimes it's easier for us to remain naked and afraid and plagued by our familiar demons. We don't have to worry about Willie. He has been clothed in his right mind and has settled into biblical history. At this moment in history, on this anniversary of 9-11, Jesus is eyeball to eyeball with us. And we would rather be left alone because if we really live into our peculiarities and calling, we will lose the illusion of control. And the illusion of control is very important when you're naked and afraid. See, on the television show, they have to transport people into a wild environment. We don't need transport. We live in a wild environment with beheadings and attacks and invasion and racial ethnic tensions. The fact is we're being called to service that's not neat and pretty. It is service and movement toward others who are naked and afraid. See, Willie was chained in tombs, and we have 21st century tombs. They look a lot like air-conditioned skyscrapers. Our tomb dwellers have fancy jobs in banks and law firms and churches, and they are also the beloved of God. But if you listen carefully, you can hear the chains rattling. It's going to take some peculiar people to stand with them, to move from comfort to commitment, from terror to teaching, from addiction to adoration, from the love of money to the love of neighbor, from God's embracing darkness toward the harsh glare of the public square. If we choose to accept our adoption by God, we will be deemed peculiar people out of step with the world, walking in the marvelous light of God. I'm closing, but... I just want you to hear it one more time. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Call forth for the praises of God who's called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. I don't know about you, but the chosenness thing, I'm a little uncomfortable with it because it usually means that somebody's in and somebody's out. 
and I don't like that very much. But that's my faulty 21st century lens. Peter's not calling us to individual privilege and chosenness. He says, it's collective. You are a chosen generation, a people, plural, citizens of a holy nation, a generation on the move toward the light. This is community action. And then he says, you're called out of darkness. So what does it mean to move from darkness to light? What does that movement mean for dark people embodied in dark skin who are also chosen, who cannot and do not want to move without their darkness? It means that we have to move beyond our conflicted racial ethnic sensibilities to recognize the beauty and positive attributes of both light and darkness. The darkness is a genesis space, a mothering darkness that launches us into the world. And according to 1 Kings, darkness is the house of God. God says, I dwell in the thick darkness. So with Ferguson still on our minds, and Trayvon Martin still close in memory, with images on television of immigrant children scrambling across our borders without their parents, I interpret out of darkness as a movement from selfish concerns, from private Jesus for private lives, toward public service, and lives lived in the glaring light of the issues of our day. Being chosen by God for us means being put on a collision course with empire, powers, principalities that rule and reign. But can we really stay in the safety of womb-like darkness while the masses, naked and afraid, scramble for food, water, shelter, with only a few survival tools and no TV crew to bail them out? See, when Willie from the Tombs is finally free, when we are finally free, clothed in our right minds, no longer naked and afraid, Jesus demands of him what Jesus demands of us. Don't sit under me, Willie. Don't sit under me, beloved. You have a unique story, a unique and peculiar story, and consequently, a unique and peculiar ministry, a pathway to service in the world. You all have come to seminary to sharpen your peculiar gifts, to discover new paths, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So as we teach and learn together this year, what we hope for your future is that your ministry is a surprise to you. <laughs> that you remember that you were chosen because of your peculiarities. That the one who called us in all of our oddness has blessed that oddness. It's going to inspire your service. Trust your gifts. They are God-given. Be yourself. Anything else is absurd. Give thanks for the alternating blessing of darkness and of light. And then walk in that light. That marvelous light, no longer naked and afraid. Yeah.